Um, welcome everyone. Thank you for jo joining today's ASBMR member spotlight brought to you by the ASBMR Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee. The series aims to highlight the research of ASBMR members in a collaborative setting and will be taking place bi-weekly on Thursdays at 3 p.m. Eastern Time through the end of 2020. ASBMR members are comprised of a diverse collection of individuals from different backgrounds countries and cultures who bring a host of life experiences, values, and belief. And this series aims in particular to shine a light on the research being done by ASBMR members belonging to groups underrepresented in biomedical research, i.e. Blacks or African Americans, Hispanics or Latinos, American Indians or Alaska Natives, or Native, Amer or Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders. But all members are invited to participate in these sessions. Highlighting our members' diversity is not only reflective of the world, but will make our community more innovative and produce better scientific research. Today's meeting will spotlight two ASBMR members. First, Rhonda Prisby, PhD, lab director and professor at the University of Texas at Arlington and ASBMR Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee Chair who will be presenting on the bone vascular system. And second, we'll have Paula Hernandez, PhD, senior research scientist at University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center, who will be presenting on osteoarthritic changes at the chondrocyte level. Each presentation will take approximately 15 to 20 minutes. And following each presentation, there will be opportunity for Q&A and discussion with the audience. As a reminder, please keep yourself muted throughout the meeting and you are welcome to unmute yourself for questions and comments following each presentation. I'd now like to invite Rhonda Prisby to begin her presentation and introduce herself. Hi everybody, um, as Lauren had mentioned, I'm the chair of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, and I'd like to welcome you guys to the series. Um, this series used to be the research interest uh, meetings, and so we had a name change and a few other changes to the series. And I'm hoping that um, everybody will consistently participate. One of the main focuses of the of this series is to allow for collaboration, allow for networking, allow for exchange of ideas and techniques. If you have um, a technique that you're an expertise you're in need of, hopefully somebody on this call can, can help you out or vice versa. Perhaps you're listening in and you are, you're presenting and, you're, and someone else will be able to help you when it's your turn to, to prevent, prevent. So I'm hoping that um, this will lead to um, more engagement among the membership, especially those of under, underrepresented community, and also lead to collaborations, um, maybe for grant proposals as well as for publications as well. So one thing that we would ask you guys to do that is if you make a connection outside of our membership spotlight series, um, that has led to a publication or led to a grant proposal, a joint grant proposal, please let us know so, so that we can kind of track the progress of, of this series. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'll share my screen. Can everybody see this? No? Okay, let me see. No. Can you see it now? There you go, we can see it. Okay. So um, I do work in the bone vascular system and I've been doing this type of work for many years now. And so I have training in vascular physiology as well as bone biology. And so the intent of my lab was to, uh, to kind of um, combine the two and, and think about ways in which the vascular system, either through health and disease, can impact the skeletal system. And so just to give you a little bit of background, um, I do um, all sorts of um, interventions in my lab. One of the main things that we look at 
our age-related changes in the vascular system, and then we try to couple those with what's happening at the bone level. Um, and so just to give you a background of what happens with age in the skeleton and also in bone marrow, we know that um, as a function of advancing age, we have diminished hematopoiesis and augmented bone marrow adiposity. Um, what we always see, um, or what we tend to see with advancing age is the increased prevalence of osteoporosis. But what people fail to realize is that that is also coupled with reduced basal dilator capacity of the bone vascular system. In other words, we see what is called reduced endothelium dependent basal dilation, which is corresponds with the decline in skeletal blood flow with age. Uh, one thing that also happens is the skeleton undergoes vascular refraction. So there's diminished number of blood vessels within the bone with age. And as a result, the, the bone marrow becomes ischemic. So I'm gonna basically focus on um, two novel bone vascular pathologies that we have um, discovered in the, lab, in the lab in the last uh, about five or six years. One is called bone marrow blood vessel ossification and the, the last one is called ossified particles. And so when we talk about bone marrow blood vessel ossification, this is what we're observing. So as I mentioned before, we look at vascular function of the skeleton. And so when we were dissecting out some blood vessels from a rat femora, this is from the femoral shaft, what we observed is what appeared to be the transition of these blood vessels into bone-like tissue. So these are, what you're looking at here is blood vessels taken from a femur from an old animal, 22 to 24 months of age. And this can be viewed with the naked eye. This image was taken with stereo microscopy. And what happens is if you pick up one of these types of vessels and you pinch too hard with the forceps, you can end up breaking this blood vessel in half. Um, we also observe this type of pathology in young animals as well. Um, after observing that type of um, ossification in the blood vessels in the old animal, we decided to look at the young animal. And what we did is we took out the entire vascular network from the femoral shaft. We cleaned away as many of the bone marrow cells as possible. We stained the blood vas vascular network with Goldner's trichrome stain, which will stain um, muscle tissue red and stain bone tissue green. And what you can see is, um, if you look at the blood vessels that are laid out on the slide, you'll see areas of green which denote bone tissue, which denote for us a transition of the vascular system into some type of calcified or ossified tissue. So the question that we had after we observed this is, do these areas of calcification or ossification represent microvascular dead space? In other words, if you have bone tissue that's growing on the blood vessels, do the blood vessels lose their ability to vasodilate or vasoconstrict? And do they lose their ability to pass blood? And so in this instant, um, this vascular network was taken from a young animal and the animal was um, a rat was four to six months of age. This is what this level of ossification looks like with light microscopy. On the left-hand side, you can see a normal bone marrow blood vessels taken from the femoral shaft. It has been pressurized. So you see the wall of the blood vessel and then you'll see the lumen of the blood vessel. On the right, you see what is probably a collection of vessels that have kind of merged and fused together and referring to this as ossified blood vessels. If you look at a higher magnification, um, you can see that the appearance of what we think are osteocyte lacunae on the surface of the blood vessel. Under scanning electron microscopy, this is what this looks like. This time we were able to get some amputated long bones from the hospital and we were able to take out some bone marrow blood vessels from an individual 68 years of age with type two diabetes mellitus. Um, we call this a transitioning blood vessel because some aspects of the blood vessel like the collagen layer here are normal to a, a blood vessel. But as you see in the higher magnification, it appears to have mineralized tissue adhered to the abluminal surface of the blood vessel. So we think given over time, this vessel would ultimately develop into what we're calling a completely ossified bone marrow blood vessel. You can see here now that the, that the structure no longer resembles a blood vessel. Um, it resembles, resembles mineralized tissue. The lumen appears to be closed off. And this particular blood vessel, we would say, would no longer be able to pass blood and participate in vascular function. So we can see this with micro CT. 
if we take out um, a rat from Mora and we're able to scan them with micro CT, what we do is we make sure that we only scan the marrow or the shaft of the bone and we exclude the cortical shell from our analysis or our scan. And what you can see, this is our young and old uh, Fisher 344 rat model, which is an aging model. Um, the young animals are four to six months of age. The old animals are 22 to 24 months of age. You can see even at four to six months of age, as was depicted with our histological slide, the beginning of ossification of the bone vascular network. But if you look over at the older animal, you can see probably the vast majority of the blood vessels have now become ossified. And that's why we're able to detect them on the micro CT. Quantitatively, you can see there's a significant increase in this level of ossification of the bone vascular network. So one of the things that we were able to do is we were able to look at the blood vessels with something called a Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. So what we did is we took um, pieces of cortical bone and we took out the bone marrow blood vessels from the femoral shaft of young animals. And then we had a corresponding old group where we had a piece of cortical bone and then the old bone marrow blood vessels from the uh, femoral shaft. Um, what you look at on the spectra is you don't really pay attention to the numbers. What you pay attention to is the waveform and the shape of the waveform. So in the blue circle, this represents the area of the spectra that's unique to bone tissue. So in other words, um, you would have your mineral to matrix ratio, your carbonate to phosphate ratio area, and your crystallinity peak area within this part of the spectra. And if you look over on the left-hand panel, you can see the young cortical bone and the shape of the spectra inside the blue circle. And you can compare that to the young bone marrow blood vessels and the shape of the waveform inside the blue circle. And you can see that the waveform is, is rather dissimilar. But if you look what happens with the aged animal, if you look at the shape of the waveform of the cortical bone in comparison to the bone marrow blood vessels, you can see that the shape of the waveform is very similar. And this can be interpreted as the bone marrow blood vessels acquiring the characteristics of old bone. So one of the things that we've been trying to do now with subsequent studies, um, all of the data that I'm showing you here has been published um, and it's um, been published for a while. Some of it has been at least. Um, and so some current projects that we've been looking at is we've been trying to tease out some etiologies as to why the bone marrow blood vessels would ossify in this, in this manner. And so one of the things that I alluded to early in the presentation is our ability to look at vascular function. And so what we do is if you look at the panel down here with the microscope set up, um, you're looking at an inverted microscope that's been hooked to a video camera, a video monitor, and the equipment surrounding the microscope is a way in which we can pressurize the blood vessel as well as measure the diameter of the blood vessel. And if you look above there, you'll see this monitor, the computer monitor that actually has an image of the blood vessel on the screen. So this is what we see when we look at our experiments. And what we can do is we, we set the vessel down into a bath of physiological saline solution. And we can add um, different agonists to the blood vessel like acetylcholine or norepinephrine. We can measure vasodilation or measure vasoconstriction. We can also influence the pressure that the vessel receives in the lumen to measure blood pressure. And we can also mimic blood flow. And in response to pressure and flow, we can uh, measure the change in diameter. So we often do these types of experiments looking at age-related changes in vascular function of the skeleton, as well as some of our other interventions. So the vessel that we primarily look at um, is called the principal nutrient artery. It has a diameter of about 100 uh, microns to 200 microns, and that's two to four times the size of a human hair. So if you look at over here, what we actually do down here, you, this is the actual vessel, the principal nutrient artery, we abbreviate it as PNA. We cannulate the vessel onto glass micropipette tips and we tie the vessel down with surgical sutures. Um, that way we're able to pressurize the vessel and mimic what would happen under physiological conditions. This particular principal nutrient artery, you can see a branch sticking out of the side of the vessel Anytime that the blood vessels have branches, that means that we cannot pressurize them, which means we also have to tie off the branch to close off the blood vessel. And so you can see over here, which the branch has now been tied off with our ophthalmic suture. 
So once the, the vessel has been pressurized and we can begin with our, our experiments. So the first video that I'd like to show you is an example of the principal nutrient artery when it's being exposed to potassium chloride. And this is what we actually see on the screen. What you're not seeing is the calipers by which we measure the change in diameter. But I'll start the video and what you'll see is a shimmer of the bath. That's the shimmering of the addition of potassium chloride and you will see the vessel constrict in response. And so we would measure the initial diameter and then once the vessel stopped constricting, we would measure the end diameter. The next video is basal dilation to acetylcholine. It's the same thing. If you pay attention to the upper part of the video, you will see basal dilation after the addition of acetylcholine. And so you, we can measure these types of responses in young and old rats or following different types of treatment. So one thing that we wanted to look at is we've been working with this, um, this rat model for several years, and we've never noticed this type of vascular pathology other than inside of the bone marrow. So this led us to believe that there was something being produced in the bone marrow that was causing this. So one thing that we decided to do is we wanted to see if the bone marrow would cause a change in vascular function. So once again, we had our young and old animals. We conducted our experiment with our principal nutrient artery looking at percent of uh, maximal basal dilation to increase the concentrations of acetylcholine. And you can see um, in the young, the white circles are the young control. The white boxes are the old control. This is normal, what you see with age, you see an age-related decline in vascular function. Um, what was surprising to us is that when we put the marrow inside of the bath with the blood vessel and we repeated our dose response curve, what we saw was a, a significant decline in basal dilator capacity in our young animals. If you compare the, the white circles with the black circles, um, the, um, something about the marrow, something that the marrow was producing caused vascular dysfunction. So if you notice with the aged animals represented by the squares, you can see that there is a decline which was not significant. And we think because um, the aged animals were already working at such a low level of basal dilation that the marrow really didn't cause much change or a significant change or further decline in function. One thing that we did was after we conducted our dose response uh, curve, we collected the physiological saline solution from the bath so that we could measure some uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines that perhaps the marrow cells were releasing. And so if you look at um, interleukin-1 alpha and interleukin-1 beta, which are pro-inflammatory, and they are associated with processes of atherosclerosis, which we think that this level of ossification is somehow related to um, that disease. Um, you could see that interleukin-1 alpha, there was a significant increase in the production of interleukin-1 alpha in the presence of the marrow in the old animals. And if you look at how um, the production of interleukin-1 beta um, turned out, you can see a significant increase in interleukin-1 beta in the presence of bone marrow in both our young and old animals. And so now we have ongoing studies trying to tease out this relationship a little bit further. So I just want to end this presentation by talking about the second discovery that we had in the lab and how we think this level of ossification within the bone tissue may be related to uh, pathologies in the peripheral blood vessels and in other tissues. So one of the things that we did when we looked at scanning electron microscopy of these ossified vessels is that we kept noticing these what appeared to be ossified particles on the abluminal and luminal surface of the vessel. So once again, this is one of these transitioning vessels taken from um, an amputated long bone of an individual 68 years of age. And you can see what we mean by the ossified uh, particle. One of the things that we hope to do with this study is compare this um, ossified vessel with a normal blood vessel. So we just took out a rat aorta and also prepared it for electron microscopy so that we can look at what a normal blood vessel should look like versus an ossified vessel. And just by chance, we noticed what was a similar type of particle sticking out of the wall of the aorta. And so this gave us the idea that if somehow during the processes of ossification, uh, parts of mineralized tissue were breaking off and gaining access to the peripheral circulation, 
and perhaps this is now why we're seeing it in um, Bay Orta, which is outside of the skeleton. So when we looked at blood samples from rats, we were able to find these types of particles. And I'm sorry, I don't have individual scale bars on each of the figures or each of the diagrams, um, but you can see that the range for this data set, the diameter size is from one to 45 microns in size. So the next thing that we wanted to do is we wanted to take human blood samples and see if we can find these types of particles in the human blood samples. And we were also able to find these types of particles in human blood samples from younger individuals, 26 to 39 years of age, as well as older individuals, 55 to 62 years of age. So keep in mind that we do have a, a smaller sample size uh, for this data set with our younger um, and older sample size being an N of six. So when we were able to look at flow cytometry and sort these types of particles out, currently we do not have an age-related difference in the number of particles in circulation between our younger and older human subjects. Um, and when we conducted a similar study with on the rats, um, to date we do not have yet seem to be able to tease out an age-related increase in these number of ossified particles in circulation but we have some um, subsequent studies and some ongoing studies that we're, that we're working on. Um, one important thing that I wanted to point out is when we separate the particles according to diameter. So we're able to have images of these particles and then look at the individual diameters and determine how many of these particles in, are in circulation if their diameter is between, for example, one and 15 microns. 15 and 30 microns, 30 and 45 microns, and so on and so forth. The vast majority of these particles are 15 microns or less in diameter, but you'll notice from our figure, and this is from our, our human subjects data, is that there are some particles, a good number of these particles that are greater than 15 microns in diameter. So the importance of the diameter size is once you get to a diameter of 15 microns or above, these types of particles in circulation could serve as potential emboli um, throughout the vascular tree. So that's another thing that we'd like to consider um, moving forward with our study. So just a few acknowledgements of some former and current PhD students in the labs. The individuals listed below, Dr. Mark Mitchell, Gene Ross, uh, Dr. Lynn Optimaker, and Dr. Rune Kumar, they helped produce some of the images and flow cytometry work um, that I presented today. Um, and just to acknowledge some grant support um, that has helped funded some of these studies um, over the years. So I'll take questions if you have any questions. Um, thank you. This is um, very interesting. I, I must confess that I, I, I never really thought much about blood vessels uh, <laughs> uh, in the bone. So I, I'm gonna ask a few naive questions. So this uh, primary um, vessel, does that have um, uh, arterioles that then connect to the, the cortical bone? Uh, is, is there a connection there? Yes, so let me um, go back to this slide here. I'll show you where it is. I failed to point that out during my presentation. Um, Oops. So there's actually an image of it here. So you can see the screen up on this image of the rat femora with the blood yeah. vessels that have been produced. So this yeah. is the principal. Oh, okay, vessel. okay. Yeah. So it goes in here and you can see once it gets into the cortical shell and into the marrow, it bifurcates into smaller arterioles, arteries and arterioles, and eventually connects with the cortical shell. I, I have a question. I'm Kamarul Hassan from University of Alabama. Do you know what kind of cells getting mineralized? Is the vascular endothelial cells or circulating osteoblast, pre-osteoblast, mesenchymal stem cells? What population of the cells is getting mineralized? And is it a kind of abnormal mineralization or it's a physiological mineralization happening? So, um, apparently, we do not know which cells might be either the vascular Rhonda, if I can interrupt, you're just a little um, hard to hear. I think your microphone might be a little quiet. I'm getting a new computer, by the way. Um, I don't know, if, is that a little bit that's better? better? Yeah, that's better. Okay. Um, so 
Currently, we do not know um, which vascular cell is being mineralized. It could be the endothelial cells, vascular smooth muscle cells. Another consideration is that um, since the blood vessels sit in the marrow that have all of the precursor cells for osteoblasts, it could be that some osteoblasts are adhering to the abluminal surface of the blood vessel and causing the mineralized tissue. So to date, we don't know which, which vessel or which cell type is causing mineralization, and that's something that we're going to look at in the future. Thank, um, you, so, thank you so much. Hi, Rhonda, this is Paula. Wonderful presentation. I have a question. Do you know if uh, you can detect this uh, mineralization also in mice? or it's too small? I mean, by micro CT, you will be able to detect them? Yes, we actually have published a paper showing this type of mineralization in the mice, in the femur. So the only bone that we've looked at so far has been the femoral shaft. Okay, thanks. Rhonda, I had a, another question. Um, the, the little particles that you see, have you looked at whether those are increased in fracture? Um, either in your rats in a model within the rats or in your human subjects? You mean after a fracture? Sorry, say that again? Did you say after a fracture? Yeah. Um, we have not done a fracture, but um, we have ongoing study now where we're um, introducing a bone defect into the animal. And so we don't have the data yet, but one of the things that we're looking at is the number of, of particles in circulation. Okay, yeah, it just seemed like it could be interesting to see if, because it, it could be the right size to cause an embolism, since you see that elevation in emboli after fracture, if that could be contributing to that. So that, that was really cool. Follow up, Rhonda. this is Bettina. I just had a question on those particles. Did you, have you done, so you, you did that with scanning electron microscopy. Did you look at energy dis dispersive x-ray analysis, you know, to see what elements are present? Yeah, we have very limited uh, analysis done like that, but we did find calcium was present. Um, and that was probably as far as we got. So we know that we calcium is present, collagen is present, um, but that's as far as we got in terms of the analysis. And, and that's one of the things that we want to do in the future is look more in depth at what these particles are made of. We, yes, suspect, right. we suspect they're similar to bone. Okay. But it's not like a red blood cell that's somehow being... No. Okay. Okay. So oh, Rhonda, I have another question about, uh, so you looked at uh, uh, IL-1, uh, you know, between the young and the old, but have you thought about maybe doing something like proteomics? Because, I mean, we can start looking at individual, you know, uh, factors to see what, what, what are the differences. But, it, you know, and, and uh, even after saying, asking about proteomics, I'm going to turn around and ask whether or not there were any differences in, say, uh, VEGF and BMP2 uh, um, uh, expression between the young and, and the old. You mean in terms of the particle itself? So um, when we looked at IL, the interleukin-1, we actually did a panel of 24, 24 plex. And so interleukin-1 was not the only either pro or anti-inflammatory cytokine that was upregulated. Um, and so, but that's um, the one that we start, we decided to focus on currently. Um, there so are some, have, yeah. Okay, yeah, so you haven't, some done a, yeah, you haven't done a growth factor panel is, is I guess is a, 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 another, yeah, question. No, um, the, panel that we, the panel that we did, um, it included VEGF and off the top of my head, I don't remember where those numbers lie. Um, but the panel did include VEGF, even though it was a, a cytokine panel. I think the cells who are getting recruited for mineralization, they will be the right target to analyze the proteomics. Because right. if, if you take out yeah, the macro sure. cells, they exactly show you the mineralized, all the mineralized factor and everything. You might not end up with discovering something. The cells who are going to get recruited to make mineralized tissue, probably they will be the right target to take for the um, proteomics. Good point. Yeah, the trick is, I think, um, you know, once we pull these types of blood vessels out and they're completely ossified, a lot of times the lumen is missing. And mm -hmm. so at that point, we really can't separate the endothelial cells from the 
vascular smooth muscle cells. Because one of one of our researcher here in University of Alabama, they look at vascular calcification mm -hmm. and they think like the vascular endothelial cells is strongly differentiated into osteoblast kind of thing. But I, that if that is the case, then it happens to everybody, but that's not happening to everybody. So it's very specific, a particular population of the cells probably they are going to recruit to that site of the mineralization and they are probably doing all these things. Um, I'm not sure, but this is my guess. So thank you so much for your presentation. Well, thank you so much, Rhonda. That was really interesting and a lot of great discussion after. Um, unless there are any last questions for Rhonda, I'd like at this point to invite Paula to begin her presentation. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Rhonda, for inviting me to present in, in these uh, sessions. Um, let me see if I can share my screen now. Do you see my screen? Yep. Okay. So my research is a bit different, is in cartilage, actually. So I'm not sure how everyone is uh, uh, familiarized with the physiology of cartilage, but I'll just give a brief introduction and then I'll show you what I've done. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm interested more, mostly at the cell level. So everybody in osteoarthritis, which has like changes at the articular cartilage uh, tissue, um, everyone pays a lot of attention of the changes at the matrix level and thinking that if you change the matrix, then you will change the physiology of the cells, which is true. But I'm also interested in, in, in learning uh, how like uh, biochemical, biophysical, you know, mechanical changes actually affect the cell first before starting all this feedback process. So this is a nice diagram of a book um, that I found where the mechanotransduction of chondrocytes is, is really uh, crucial for this, because if you give the right cues, for example, compression, shear, hydrostatic pressure in the physiological rate, then the cells will respond by synthesizing the right components, which in this case, in the case of cartilage, are uh, collagen 2 aggregate, which are the, 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 mo the major uh, components of the extracellular matrix, and the rest of the, of the collagens as well. There are several other collagens besides collagen 2. Um, but in turn, if you give the wrong mechanical cues or, or you give inflammatory signals, then these will translate into synthesis of metalloproteinases or other extracellular matrix proteinases that will degrade the matrix and, and pro-inflammatory cytokines. So, so that's basically what, what I'm interested in, what I'm going to show you. So just to give a brief introduction, so we all uh, understand that cartilage is a tissue that's mostly composed of water, then the collagen network, proteoglycans, and then the cells. Um, and the cells perceive the mechanical uh, signaling from the, from the loading, from the constant loading. How does this work? So the proteoglycan absorbs all the water since it's negatively charged, and the collagen network will be in charge of preventing the tissue from collapsing or from swelling when you have this liquid. So this is so packed that the permeability is, is it's very low. So the water doesn't, doesn't flow too much, it flows a little bit, but not extremely. And uh, it's uh, avascular, it's uh, hypoxic as well. So all the exchange of nutrients uh, will be um, depending on the synovial fluid, which, which is the liquid um, in there. So the, the beauty about the cartilage is that the way that it works with, I was telling you, the component that has the water, which is the protoglycan versus the collagen network, is that when you um, compress cartilage, for example, all the initial load will be borne by the protoglycans, but the liquid. And then if it's strong enough and if it's like steady state for a while, then the fluid will finally exude and then the, 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 the solid component, which is the matrix, will be the one that will bear the load. So all this creates cyclic uh, hydrostatic pressures, which are very important for the chondrocyte, again, to do this mechanotransduction and synthesize the right, the right component. So um, one thing that uh, this, this figure is going to be important to understand uh, the results that I'm going to show you in a second is that if you have, imagine this is, this is a piece of cartilage, right? It's that diagram and the bone is gonna be at this side. This is the, the surface of the cartilage. So if you have a contact pressure in the surface, 
the upper layers of the, of the cartilage will be the ones that will have the most uh, fluid pressure, tension, and the most compress compressive strains compared to the bottom one, where since I was telling you, there's no much uh, uh, permeability in the tissue of the water and definitely not in the subchondral bone, then there's not gonna be much fluid in here, but the compression is gonna be mostly in this area. Also, there's gonna be tension because if you imagine like a sponge, if you're compressing a sponge, then the, the, the cartilage that it's there is gonna be under tension to prevent the tissue from collapsing. So actually uh, some people did this, this report, um, did an experiment where they show that when you compress cartilage, the areas where you see the most deformation are in the surface, not really at the bottom. And why is this important? You'll see, you'll see now, when you have osteoarthritis, you start losing uh, upper layers, right? Um, and then you, uh, at the later stages of osteoarthritis, you see this calcification of the deeper layer. And this is not just an aging disease. Um, you can, the, the, the probability of the, uh, getting it, it's higher if you're older, right? But it doesn't necessarily mean that if you're getting older, you're going to get osteoarthritis. Actually, this is an example we work in the lab with, um, uh, hip uh, uh, samples from hips. And these are samples in, from hip replacements that we took in the lab. And you can see like a 60 year, a three year old male has a very bad looking cartilage in the surface of the head, the femoral head, but a 90 year old female has very smooth cartilage. So it doesn't necessarily mean that for getting old, you're gonna get osteoarthritis, which is really good news for some of us. <laughs> So uh, one model that we, we took for this project was the developmental dysplasia of the hip or hip dysplasia. Why? Because this can cause early onset osteoarthritis. So um, I heard with a, with a surgeon, I'm in the orthopedic surgery department at UT Southwestern, and, and he's very interested in hip dysplasia. So we paired up um, and he collected a lot of uh, samples from hip dysplasia patients. And I took them to the lab and hip dysplasia for some of, uh, if, if any of you is not um, familiarized with it, is when you have uh, the hip, you, you have to uh, put the, the head and the, and the socket, like they have to fit perfectly in order to distribute all the forces, right? But if you don't have the, the head fitting perfectly in the socket because of a deformation or because the socket sometimes is too shallow, then what happens is you don't have a right distribution of the forces. So you have focalized forces and you have focalized damages. So that's why later on these people start uh, developing osteoarthritis, but actually it's early onset. We've, we've been getting samples from patients that are 20, 25 years old, 30 years old, very young compared to patients that you see the development of, of, of osteoarthritis in 60 plus years old. Uh, so it's a very concerning situation. So. What we did first, we wanted to understand what are the changes that we're seeing along with the progression of osteoarthritis, not hip dysplasia involved. And then we compare that to the hip dysplasic patients to see what are the actual differences. So this is an example of a sample from just regular um, OA, osteoarthritis, and areas are damaged in the cartilage and areas are undamaged. Uh, it's not normal, but we call it undamaged OA. And we did uh, histological stain, staining of suffering O, which is the proteoglycan content. And uh, we used a Mankin score, modified Mankin score. And what's a Mankin score? Mankin score um, takes in account like the surface, the smooth of the surface, the amount of uh, suffering, uh, staining, the amount of cells, uh, and you, what, what's happened in the subchondral bone, but we actually are not taking subchondral bone. That's why we call it modified because we're taking that, that uh, parameter away. So, but here's basically what you see in undamaged uh, cartilage. You see it's smooth surface. You see a lot of protoplycan staining, but in the damage, you're starting to see all these, um, you know, fibrillations of cartilage. You also have some clonal expansion on, on some areas, some cell death as well. Uh, so the, the changes are, 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 are visible, of course. Um, what we found in the just normal OA cartilage, not, not the hip dysplasia at this point, is that we study a protein um, that it's an enzyme, it's called HGRA1, that is uh, extracted, is exported, sorry. It's a serine protease that works degrading the matrix. There's some um, studies uh, that have focused on this protein, but the majority of the studies in osteoarthritis are really focused on metalloproteinases in MMPs. 
So this is also produced by the cell during osteoarthritis. And what we found is we took um, samples from several patients and we, uh, we scored them with this uh, modified Mankin score system. Uh, and we found that the number of positive cells in each uh, uh, sample, according to the Mankin score, they kind of correlate. So there's a, a, a nice trend where if you have a, the, the actually the, the low number in Mankin score is no much uh, damage. So it's gonna control and damage cartilage. The larger the number of the Mankin score is the worse the, the stage of the, of the osteoarthritis on the cartilage. So if you have a kind of good looking cartilage for saying that way, you don't have many cells expressing this protein, but once you pass this threshold and, and the cartilage start getting more damaged, then you see more presence of this protein in the cells or more positive cells in here. So this is a histological uh, staining. This is a confocal microscopy um, uh, image. So we have that in mind, right? Now, what happens at the level of other proteins such as agregan or collagen 2? So what we found, we compare the um, and damage, and damage uh, away only in the, here is the area. So we found that they still have agregan staining, they still have collagen 2 staining, they don't have much HDR1, again, uh, the same result as I was just showing you, they don't have much MMP13, which is one of the matrix metalloproteinases. We expect that they don't have much cell death either. So they're kind of good looking um, cartilage with uh, mostly intact matrix. When you look at more advanced stages of osteoarthritis, you start seeing um, that the agregan is missing, the collagen 2 expression is very low. We know that the, the collagen 2, what happens is getting degraded as for the agregan. You have more uh, cells positive for HGR1, and also you have more cells that are positive for other for metalloproteinases such as MMP13. Um, you also have some cell death. So this is not novel. We're just setting up the standards to compare with the hip dysplasia, right? The novelty of this is this protein that no one really has studied under the progression of osteoarthritis. So when you start looking at cartilage from uh, hip displays examples, this is, a, this is an example of it. So you have a lot of undamaged uh, cartilage. And I, as I was explaining you, since you kind of don't have a perfect fit of the femoral head into the socket, then you have these focalized forces that were, what are they doing is uh, focalizing damages in the head. So you have sections that they're very normal looking, uh, nice looking cartilage, smooth, you have the right uh, amount of proteoglycan in there. And then you have damage where you start seeing um, areas where you don't have much proteoglycans. And in this particular case, the, smooth, the surface is not that bad, although it's much uh, uh, thinner than the regular cartilage. But in some cases, you also see something, uh, some situations very similar to advanced osteoarthritis, right? These patients were in surgery because of the heat replacement because of osteoarthritis. So we got interested in what's going on in those areas. I'm going to come back in these areas where this is undamaged still. Is it the same as just a regular um, heap that is not heap displacing? So this was a very interesting finding that when we analyze the presence of HGRA1 in these cells, we found that undamaged uh, cartilage already has a lot of cells that are expressing this matrix protease. So if you compare again in the uh, Mankin score, if you remember the other curve was like this, was like very, uh, um, sorry, was uh, very low expression or very very few cells expressing HGR1 at this area. But in this case, when you have the same um, uh, damage uh, grade, then you have a lot of cells expressing this. So it's kind of early on. And this was very interesting because if you look again, this is not damaged yet. The matrix is not completely, completely degraded. So what is this? So then we went to see what happens with the other proteins that we were studying. So again, agrican and collagen, which are the major of the extracellular matrix, they are expressed well. Uh, we see a good staining, histological staining of both. These are all confocal uh, images, by the way. We're starting to see uh, the HGR1 cells, the positive ones, we also see a lot of cells positive for MMP13. Um, we don't see much cell death yet, just very few. It's not, um, it's not a lot. So something is going on at this point. 
where the cells are perceiving um, early changes, are detecting early changes, and they are starting to express the wrong cues. Remember the first slide that I show you with a diagram where if the cells perceive the wrong cues and they will synthesize the wrong elements, right? So they're already perceiving this, but this is interesting. They're not damaged. The tissue is not damaged yet. So when you go and see the damage, yes, you see what, what you're expecting, right? The, the aggregate and the collagen stainings are not really good anymore. You still have some HCR1. Interestingly, you don't have that much MMP13 anymore. Maybe it's already degraded all the tissue. And you start seeing more cell death as well. So that's predictable of a regular uh, advanced OH stage. So after this, we wanted to know uh, what happens with a couple of elements that we know that might be related to transmission of forces, right? One thing could be inflammation. One, one thing in osteoarthritis could be uh, a different mechanical force, right? So one element in the cell that is very important for forces is a cytoskeleton. And among cytoskeleton, we have the intermediate, dementing intermediate filaments are very important to, um, to keep up the cell shape and to keep, protect the cell from the mechanical damage. So they're crucial for it. And then another element that it's important for mechanotransduction in chondrocytes is the uh, integrins because they mediate uh, the cell and ECM interaction. So um, you have receptors for fibronectin, you know, for laminin, and, and they kind of sense all the forces. So we wonder what happens with these two elements in the in heat dysplasia. So what we found is again, I have undamaged and damage here uh, for osteoarthritis, for regular osteoarthritis. And what we found is dementing, which is the cytoskeletal protein, is not much expressed. There are not much uh, of these networks of dementing in the cells when the cartilage is normal, at least in this area. These pictures were all taken from the, from the upper middle area of the cartilage. But then when you have damaged cartilage, there's a lot of expression of these um, cytoskeletal networks. So we think that the cell might need to protect itself from the, from the compressive damage. Um, the same happens with integrin. There's some expression of integrin in normal cartilage, but you have more integrin aggregation in damaged cartilage. Um, so when, when you see this in, in, in heat displaced cartilage, interestingly, what we found is when you have undamaged cartilage, um, that you remember, you have the expression of HGR1 already, but you also have expression of Vivendi, you have the formation of the cytoskeletal network already in the cells, even though the, the tissue is not damaged. So there is something, and this is comparing with the undamaged from just a regular way, so you can see the difference. So there is something in there that's happening that the cells are perceiving even before all the cell or, or, the, or the tissue damage has started. So the, to answer the question about the inflammation, we checked on the expression of uh, IL-1 beta from all these patients, and we did not find any significant difference in the expression of IL-1 beta. So perhaps might not be inflammation. Actually, we also did uh, an experiment using chondrocytes from, from, human, from human cells, and uh, we exposed them to IL-1 beta for 24 hours, and we uh, observed that the expression of dementing decreases uh, significantly with inflammation. So we're just, you know, coming back to this again and saying, okay, if the if dementing expression decreases actually with inflammation, then perhaps all this process is not just due to an inflammatory distribution or spreading in the tissue. It might be something perhaps more mechanical. Um, so we're at this at the point of like understanding: is this a mechanical difference, a mechanical load? Dementing actually responds to mechanical load. If you compare here, you have uh, three different stages of, of cartilage degradation. And you can see in, in blue are the nuclei of the cell and in green is a staining for dementing type skeleton. So what you see in kind of normal looking cartilage is that the upper section, the surface cells don't express much of this dementing. Well, they do express it, but they don't, they don't form these cages, right? Uh, it's more in the middle area over here. As when you have more degradation of the cartilage, the expression you start seeing it up, right? Um, one explanation could be that this layer up is being, you know, um, uh, it's, it's kind of degraded, so you kind of not see it, but um, also spreads out towards the, the the bottom of the cartilage, and the intensity of the fluorescence is is higher as well on these cells. 
So something happens to these cells that they are perceiving that's different um, in, in osteoarthritis or in hip dysplasia. And the cells make this cage to protect from mechanical loading. So we're trying to approach this in two ways. First, we're seeing mechanical loading as tension because remember cartilage also experienced tension at the surface at least. So we did an experiment with uh, uh, chondrocytes from, from humans as well. And we used a system that's called FlexCell, where uh, you uh, uh, plate the cells in these uh, uh, membranes, flexible membranes, and you use a vacuum. And what it does is like uh, uh, stretches the membrane, so it produces tension. Um, and we did this for 24 hours and in, in a membrane that's coated either with fibronectin or with collagen one. And we found that when the matrix is coated with fibronectin, we see a, a significant reduction actually in the expression of fibronectin. Um, this is interesting because in the past I've, I've worked with tendon as well. And once I stained a, a, a rat tendon with uh, vimenting and I really couldn't see any staining in the tendon itself. I saw it just in the insertion point. So it, perhaps the tension itself, it's decreasing the expression of vimenting, but now we are uh, about to get uh, a new machine in the lab that will allow us to test for compression. And our model will be doing it in alginate beads, which is a hydrogel that you can polymerize with the use of calcium and the cells are embedded inside the, 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 the bead. And you can put it in this machine and apply cycling compression, cyclic compression and, and study the expression of inventing. So we hope that the compression will indeed increase the expression of vimenting. That's our hypothesis. And the hypothesis is that the, the, the cells, the uh, uh, chondrocytes in, in patients with hip dysplasia, even though the matrix is not completely um, damaged yet, or it's not even damaged yet, the cells are already perceiving mechanical forces, changes in mechanical forces that make respond. And this could be uh, the generation of early onset osteoarthritis. And we're saying that at least in early onset osteoarthritis in hip dysplasia starts at the chondrocyte level, doesn't start at the matrix, starts at the chondrocyte level. So this is just summarizing our interest uh, in, in studying all the mechano uh, sensing or, or different mechanical cues that affect the cytoskeleton and which in turn will affect the gene expression and, and tissue homeostasis. Um, so with that, I'll conclude and, and I'm open for questions. Hi, uh, I'm Paula. Hi, Paula. Very nice talk. So I have a question. Do you think that the reason why you saw the down regulation of amentine is because you were doing a 2D culture for your stretching? You couldn't do a 3D, right? Right. And unfortunately, it's impossible to do that particular stretching for, for uh, in a 2D, in a 3D, sorry. But uh, no, I don't think it will be, because the cells are, are grown only for one passage. We don't grow them for longer because they start losing the, the uh, markers for chondrocytes. So um, I don't think it will be just something like that. Um, I, actually, if you... In the mesenchymal, epithelial to mesenchymal transition, you actually see an increase in vimenting. So you might even expect the opposite, but we're not reaching that point just yet. Thanks. Sure. Can I ask you a very fundamental question? Absolutely. Th thank you for your presentation. So matrix has soluble fraction, matrix has fibrous protein, and matrix has proteoglycan. Right. And, right. and the protein you saw, H, uh, H HTRA1, uh -huh. that's a serine protease, am I right? Yes. So I saw one of your data that fibronectin with biminectin that, so do you think that fibronectin is a target for the serine proteases? Well, actually that, that's a very good question because HTRA1 in other system has been related to fibronectin. Um, there's a, HGR1 is also a controller of the, of the TGF beta pathway, and it's an activator of the TGF beta. So, in some tissues like cartilage as well, there's TGF beta is stored in the matrix, and the, the docking, the dock system mm -hmm. is fibronectin. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, that could be one option. 
HDR1 does target fibronectin. There's a paper saying that uh, HDR1 digests fibronectin, digests fibronectin and digests HDR1, uh, sorry, uh, TGA beta activating. So it could be any of that. It could be something that we think it might be happening in the pericellular matrix. Uh, mm. But HDR1, since it's a serine protease, like the trypsin family, uh, targets so many different things. And most of that is not even characterized yet. Yeah, but, but mostly affected use, maybe TGA beta fibronectin, but that parallel pathway or parallel signal is going on, but fibronectin yeah. loves integrin through our yes, genome. Through exactly. Our genome. So exactly. That serine proteases is actually modulating the availability of the growth factor to fibronectin kind of things. Yeah. There. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Sure. Nice presentation. So Thank I just you. had a, a general question. You may have mentioned it uh, several times during my heart, it. but when you were talking about vimentin and you're talking about how you thought it might be um, sensitive to mechanical loading. So under normal conditions, when you don't have damage, what, what is vimentin responsible for doing? Yeah, so in a, in a normal cartilage, what you see is that in the surface, which is the one that have the most compression and tension, uh, you don't see much vimenting uh, expressed in there. The, in the histology, you don't see that much. And that explains probably why under the experiments with tension, you see the creation of uh, expression of vimenting because this area has a lot of tension as well. So you decrease that, but then the, the area immediate from that, like in the, in the middle zone of the cartilage, that's when in a normal looking uh, cartilage, you see expression of immune thing. So it's there, it's a good thing, right? But my hypothesis is that my respond to compress compression and might indicate extra or abnormal compressive forces in cartilage. So do you think then that the momentum is, is contributing to the damage if you have um, abnormal expression of it? At this point, no. I think that dementing is something that uh, the cell is making in order to protect itself. Because if you if you in a chondrocyte disrupt the dementing network, then this this chondrocyte is going to be uh, it's going to be sicker for saying that way. You're going to disrupt the homeostasis of the cell. Um, so it's needed. It's needed to protect it. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for your presentation, Paula. Um, if there aren't any last minute questions, just wanna thank everyone for joining. I know we're a couple minutes over, but I did just wanna take the opportunity to remind everyone that um, these meetings will be taking place bi-weekly on Thursday. Um, moving forward at the same time slot at 3 p.m. Eastern time, um, you can view the schedule, register to present and attend meetings at the ASBMR website at asbmr.org slash member spotlight series. Um, thanks so much for attending and we hope to see you next time. Thank you.